In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus exhorts his followers to embrace standards of righteousness that exceed legal requirements and traditional expectations. A reading from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said to the disciples, You have heard it said uh, uh, that it was said of those who in ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there at the, before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're on your way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it said that uh, to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Please be seated. Sisters and brothers in faith, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know if you know this, but my mother was a genius. You just need to know that. She was just really, really smart. <laughs> I remember one of, the, one of the ways I know she was a genius is she would let me and my brothers um, cut the dessert that, we would, that she would serve to the family, you know, and so I would get to cut it, and it was great. I'd cut it up and, and distribute it to everybody. And it turns out, I always got a little bigger piece than everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was innocent. I was doing my best to make it equal, but my brothers did not think it was fair. And so my mother decided, in her intelligence, in her geniusness, that I could cut the pie. I could keep doing that but my brothers got to choose which piece they got first before me. <laughs> and you know, I, suddenly those pieces got much more equal over time. It was just kind of amazing how she did that. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I always want my share and maybe just a little bit more. Is that true for you? Maybe I'm just a weird, evil person, but I always want my share and just a little more, you know, because I worked for it or something. <laughs> And it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's pie or profits or mulligans when I'm golfing <laughs> or the price on a car that I might want to buy. Just, you know, my share, just a little bit more. And I think that's maybe the first reason we have for those commandments that Jesus gave us today that sound a little rough. <laughs> They're not there, as some would say, to give you your best life now, although they might do that. What they're really there for is to protect your neighbor from you and from me. They're there to protect the other. 
because we all kind of go after just a little bit more than maybe is our fair share. Jesus calls us in his sermon to not just avoid killing anyone, that's not that hard, but to protect your neighbor. And don't just avoid adultery, but treat everyone you meet as if they are your daughter. And don't swear falsely. Tell the truth. That means no gossip, no fake news, whether it's talking on the phone or talking on Twitter. We're always going to tell the truth. No swearing. Some people in, the, in Jesus' time had mastered these laws, believe it or not. They had really mastered them. The scribes and the Pharisees, they were called, and they worked very hard to make sure they followed every single one, not just the Ten Commandments, but also the 613 other laws that they found in, the, in, in Moses' law, 613. I can't even handle ten. They were doing 613. All the way down, if, if you read in other parts of the Bible, they were, they were so careful about this that they even, they even tithed. They gave 10% of, of the harvest in their garden down to dill and cumin and mint. I mean, they're spices. Can you believe that? Would you do that? <laughs> they did that. That's how crazy they were about this. Why? Why would, they, why would anyone do such a thing? Well, the point of the law for them was holiness purity. Because it says right there in the Bible, you shall be holy as the Lord your God is holy. And so these guys, they pursued it and they were good. Uh, they were really good. You couldn't, well, I don't know you, you all that well. I know some of you. Um, I couldn't hold a candle at them, to them. They were doing such a good job at it. They were disciplined. They were obedient. They were studious. They covered it all. And then Jesus says at the beginning of the sermon today, that we're, we're in the third week of this sermon that he gave, but he said in the very beginning, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no way be part of the kingdom of heaven. Exceeds what these guys are doing. Who can do that? Who could ever do that? Well, I hear that and I know I don't have a prayer. How about you? <laughs> There's no way. I have trouble with those Ten Commandments, much less 613. And then today, in his sermon, Jesus makes it worse, right? Not only don't murder, but don't be angry with your brother. Don't insult your neighbor. I mean, what's, where's the fun in that if we can't insult our neighbors? That's how. And don't even, don't even come to church. Don't even come to church and give your offering if, if you have, have a problem with somebody. Stay away from church. Go fix your relationship with that other person. And when that's fixed then you can come to church. I don't know. Do we want to do that, really? <laughs> I mean, who can do that, Jesus? That's crazy. Why is he making it so hard? I was taught in seminary that when working with alcoholics, you might there's a strategy that they gave us a whole bunch of things to do, but one of the first things you do when working in a, with an alcoholic was to, well, one of the problems with that disease is it, you never want to admit that that's the problem. The problem is always something else. It's never, never the alcohol. And so one, one of the first things you do is to say, okay, maybe you're right. Um, go ahead. You go to the bar anytime you want. Have two drinks, no more. Go home. Um, you know, it's fine. You're not an alcoholic. Do that for a year. See how it goes. Most people can do that. But about 5 or 10% of the population um, cannot. Alcoholics, they, their body processes alcohol different than the rest of the population. And they just cannot control um, what happens after that first drink. They cannot predict what's going to happen next. And they might succeed now and then, but can, they won't be able to do it consistently. And so, after a year, uh, maybe, and they see that they can't, really can't do it, maybe, maybe the, they'll be able to admit to themselves, maybe I've got a problem here. So that's the idea. You make it harder, um, see if they can admit to themselves, and maybe, maybe when they do that, they can start to seek help. That's, what, that's where they really need to go. Okay, so why did I tell you that story? Likewise, um, Jesus knows that we are all sinners, we are all broken people, and we are all self-serving in many ways. 
And so he radicalizes the law so that maybe so that maybe we can see that we really can't do this. And maybe we realize that, okay, there, I've, I haven't got a chance. And it drives us into the arms of our Lord to say something like, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, right? Which is exactly what our Lord wants to hear from us and exactly what our Lord wants to give us, mercy. Not purity, mercy. Luther called it God's strange use of the law, where God would use the law to drive us to Jesus. Huh. Interesting. Um, maybe it works, I don't know. So two purposes of these laws that Jesus gave us, one, to protect our neighbor from us, and the second purpose, to maybe push us into, into the arms of Jesus, who wants to give us mercy. Okay, we still haven't solved the problem of those Pharisees, though. What about those Pharisees and scribes? Well, Jesus noticed that those Pharisees, they could say, and they did say, well, I haven't killed anybody, so I've kept the commandment. And they would never give a second thought to the neighbor they might have injured or neglected or, or spoken poorly of. And they could consider themselves pure and holy before God, and the neighbor was not protected or served. And I think it was Jesus' conviction. Is that really what the law is for? Just to be kind of a checklist so that we can see that we're okay with God without ever having relationship with the neighbor? David Loos tells the story of his friend Frank, who when he was eight years old, he was arguing with his sister, and the argument turned into pushing and shoving, and pretty soon he was on top of his sister with her arms pinned down, and he had his fist in the air ready to strike her, and of course that's when mom walks in. It always happens that way. And she said, Frank, stop it. And Frank said with his eight-year-old certainty, she's my sister, and I can do anything I want with her. <laughs> And his mother swooped over him and said, well, she's my daughter, and no, you can't. <laughs> like a mom, this God we have loves all his children, all of them, fiercely. <laughs> and we have no right to hurt, to deprive, to exclude, to violate any of them. And our Lord, in fact, calls us to do more, to love our neighbor as God loves our neighbor and as God loves us. And so these laws, according to Jesus, are not a way to get ourselves to heaven. You don't do good and get yourself to heaven. No, that's not what it is about. It's more like, oh, what is it like? When my grandmother passed away, um, the family was kind of gathered around. It was a very peaceful time. And we all said our goodbyes on how much we loved her and how much we thank and, you know, thanked her for, for being with us and being who she was with us. And then she said, first of all, to each of her children, <laughs> you love one another or I'm going to haunt you. <laughs> And then she said it to each and every one of her grandchildren, too. You, no fighting. You love one another. She loved every single one of us fiercely. And she expected us to love one another just as fiercely as she loved us. Huh? I think that's what Jesus is aiming at here in, our, in that Sermon on the Mount today. Not following the law as some sort of set of requirements that we have to fill, but to love one another as our Lord loves you and, and as our Lord loves your neighbor sitting next to you. So when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, don't imagine something way up there in the sky. Imagine a community. Imagine a community where there's not only no murder, which is a pretty good thing, no murder, but where folks are never angry at one another, where they reconcile and forgive one another before they even come to church. <laughs> I 
And when they never insult one another, either in person or in gossip circles or, or anywhere else. Imagine a community not only with no adultery, but as good as that would be, but where folks work to strengthen those, close, those relationships that are closest to them, where families thrive and where relationships are stable. And imagine a community where everybody tells the truth. <laughs> How odd would that be? Where people keep their promises and people trust one another and people are trustworthy. Wouldn't that be a great community? Hmm? Jesus calls that the kingdom of heaven. Hmm? And Jesus says, live right now as if that's true. Because it is. Our Lord's love for you is sure and it is strong. And our Lord's love for the person next to you is sure, and it is strong. And our Lord's love for the person that you call enemy is sure, and it is strong. Love them as our Lord does. Okay, so how do I make this practical? If that's the case, if God would rather have us tend to relationships than to tend to our, you know, following the law, if that's really what it's about, and, and if he wants us to do this before we even come to church. Well, what are we going to do in the next week? I'd like you to do two things in the next week. First, think about a healthy relationship you have, something that's life-giving, something a relationship you would never give up. Think about what makes it so good. And why is it so important to you? And then give thanks to God for that relationship, for that person that's part of your life and that relationship that you share. That's the first thing. Second thing, think about a relationship that you have that is broken or in trouble. And don't worry about who's to blame. Don't think about all that. That's not what we're after here, but just one that's broken or in trouble. And then hold that person, whoever it is, in prayer this week. And ask for God's help and healing in that relationship. And ask God what you might do to move that relationship from where it is to a better place. God's law is not about making ourselves righteous. <laughs> it's about our relationships. And it's about the community we create through them. It's about this God who loves the neighbor and who loves you. And we're both precious children. And like my grandmother said, <laughs>